be a really interesting talk. Uh, we have Dr. Patricia Swain here, who is coming to us from Mash Massachusetts uh, Fish and Wildlife. And she's working in the uh, Natural Heritage and Environmental um, in Endangered Species Program. And she focuses, it, it's very interesting, focuses on the, um, the sort of the community level, so um, natural communities. So uh, she works with people who focus on individual and endangered species, but she's focused, she takes a, an approach that kind of zooms out and looks at communities that are critical for conservation. And um, she's going to tell us about her work today. And if you find her work particularly inspiring and you're interested in following, her foot, following in her footsteps, um, I, it's interesting to note that she started right here at Tufts as an undergraduate too, so uh, maybe she'll tell you a little bit about how she made her way in her career. Uh, she's been doing this uh, act in this uh, the, the same work uh, with with uh, natural communities now for over two decades. So she brings a real wealth of experience. We're very lucky to have her. So thank you, Dr. Swing. Yeah. Thank you. Technology is not my thing. Um, this is slide is that the next couple slides have way too much information on them. But this one uh, we always find faintly amusing because we're down at the bottom, a little tiny program with 30 people and an agency of 120 people in a department and in the Commonwealth. And we have to give them all credit, partly because they pay for us. Uh, and I came up with the uh, title way before I knew what I was going to say. And I was really going to focus on classifying natural communities because that's what I do. That's my passion. But then a couple weeks ago, we had some in-house talks. And the restoration ecologists were talking about how they use the community information and do restoration and management. And I thought, oh, that's a lot cooler. So we're going to have more of that. Uh, a little bit of background. Oh, I was going to do general background, me. Uh, the, I did go to Tufts uh, a while ago. And then I went to the University of Minnesota. And when I got out there, I was a little shocked when I was taking the uh, general ecology plant communities class. All these people could name plants. They knew the animals. They knew the soils. And I knew how to write papers. I knew how to do the research. They hated essay questions. I thought, three points in an essay question. Forget this multiple choice. We have to know the details. That's what they wanted. They could choose the answers. So we were coming together. When, when you're here, at least in my day, we really were being trained to go on and learn other stuff how to learn. You sort of get sick of that from your professors. You really are being taught how to learn. You're being taught how to write. I still do a lot of writing. We have a couple of documents up here that I would love to not carry back to the office. Um, they're state planning documents, but if you're interested in generalizations, they're t they are examples of how to use some tools, how you can use rare species information to go on. And I'll talk about them a bit more. But do take them if you have any interest in the general picture as well as something specific. And I did edit. I was the chief editor on one of them, which I will say my name is not on it by choice because by the time it got done a year late, I was so embarrassed I couldn't stand the thought of having my name on it. My boss said, next time put your name on it. Uh, but the point is, you still write. I edit the agency newsletter because of a feeling for language. And I have learned along the way some specifics on uh, plant communities, but also some of the plants and a very few of the animals. I am not good at animals. But I think you're going to need whatever you're focused on here to get on in the conservation or environmental world. You need to know something specific. Maybe it's ecotoxicology. Maybe it's air quality. Maybe it's hydrology. Maybe it's the law re involving rare species or conservation. But once you have something specific, you can go on and get a general job. But you have to know something specific and something pretty up to date on the specifics. We occasionally hire um, temporary people. And I have not hired people who knew exactly what I knew and were functionally clones. Because if we needed more, we needed the next step. We needed somebody who could do modeling. I don't do modeling uh, or analysis of data. So think about you're getting a lovely general approach to things, but what really interests you in the, within that, and try to figure out how you can get more information more on that, either engineering classes or as grad students, end of rant. Uh, 
The Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program is in the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, which when I started with them 28 years ago, I thought, oh, they're so traditional, they're so focused on wildlife. I wanted to be in a forest and parks organization or something big picture. Our director says wildlife includes invertebrates. He didn't fight the law, he wanted that. In fact, wildlife includes plants. Wildlife includes natural communities to some extent. I have a permit based on the fact that I work for a wildlife agency that lets me trespass. I've never pushed it. This is based on wildlife has traditionally, since it moves around, goes onto private land, so wildlife professionals within the agency can trespass in doing their work with the wildlife. And because I'm a professional in the wildlife agency, I have that same permit. I think that's absolutely remarkable. But as I say, we don't push that real hard. <laughs> Um, we regulate, our, our focus within the Natural Heritage Program is rare species. Natural Heritage Programs were set up in the late 70s by the Nature Conservancy, put into state agencies, um, in a whole variety of state agencies, might be in the Department of Economic Development, might be in forests and parks, might be in fish and wildlife, uh, sometimes they're at the university, the state university. To, the whole point was to survey for rare species within a state, keep track of them. We all share a database. We have individual portions, so we only have Massachusetts data, but there's a format, and, the, and TNC, which is now no longer connected with the heritage programs in general, set this up so there was uniform protocols. All the states, Navajo Nation, most of the provinces, several Central American and South American countries, have natural heritage programs. So if you go somewhere and you want to do biodiversity planning, check the state's natural heritage program for data. Ours, it, the data isn't available as raw data, some states it is, but you can always get go to the program, sometimes it's one person, it might be 30 like us. New York State's got many more scientists and fewer regulators, but there's always a program with data. Uh, that was another rant. Oh, the communities, now we regulate in Massachusetts the rare species. I'll be talking about that as an example of how it's done here. It's not done the same way everywhere. Now, so communities, which I deal with, are not regulated. Uh, when I made the slide, I had 108 types defined. I had gotten rid of some. I was in a meeting last week, and everybody kept saying, no, you don't want to get rid of that one. So I put it back to 109. Of these, 77 are priority types. That means they're uncommon in the state. The reason there's so many uncommon ones is as soon as we start finding, doing surveys and finding things are uncommon, we look and see, well, it's oak, but it's a little different from others, so we split. So the common stuff are big lumps, and I will actually talk about that partway through. I'll split off from what else I'm talking about. But by defining types, we just don't split out the really common things. Uh. Natural Heritage is sort of our program uh, in Massachusetts. We have three different groups of people. We do information management. They collect the data. The biologists collect the data. They put it in the database. They keep track of the database. They run the database. They um, then also have outreach, educational things, uh, like this file map. This, that poster goes with these books of planning documents and also uh, coordinating with other organizations. We do regulate, regulatory review. Massachusetts has probably the strongest Endangered Species Act in the country. It is stronger than the National Endangered Species Act because we regulate plants and invertebrates on public and private land. We um, are very grateful to the lawyers in the Attorney General's office who just protect, um, defended us in a case where what, how our procedures were uh, being fought by a landowner who didn't believe that he had a rare species on the property, didn't believe it made a difference to where he should put his uh, driveway, and claimed that he wasn't able to develop his 30 acres, which was not the case, of course. Uh, and so he took it to the state Supreme Judicial Court, and the Attorney General's office fought it, working with our biologists and our policy people. And we won everything in that case, which is really remarkable. Uh, so it's a very strong act. Um, 
So that's the development part. And then conservation science, this is their banding turns. So we do everything from finding rare species, locating them, um, doing some monitoring of particular species and management of particular species, and also um, management of land, which is the last bunch of slides. So in information management, uh, they track current and historical observations of state listed species, and we also decide what is rare in the state. And right now we're going through, it's now every four years, it used to be every couple of years um, that we go through this process of reviewing what's rare, prioritizing what's rare, making sure the ranks are right, updating the taxonomic names, which since many of the taxonomic fields fiddle with the names constantly. The moths name change all the time. Plants are terrible right now. They go through periods of time when sometimes the names are changed and um, a whole bunch of names are changed and then we'll go through more quiet periods. These are the scientific names which are supposed to be set in perpetuity. Not the case. Um, anyway, the data managers uh, maintain information on the communities as well as um, the rare species observations. And the certified vernal pools are, vernal pools are spring pools, they're wet in the spring, and then they dry out. They have to dry out because the key to them is they're fishless. And that allows amphibians to lay their eggs in them and um, produce more amphibians. If you have fish, they eat the amphibian eggs, nasty things. Um, that's actually regulatory. We don't have, uh, because we do, do such a strong regulatory effort with vernal pools, we took that out of the classification of natural communities as a type. They're all teeny on the ground anyway, and it was just going to be too confusing between our many, many certified vernal pools. Certified just means we've looked at them and agree that they're a vernal pool. Um, so they're protected under the Wetlands Act. And I'll get through the acts that protect the rare species in the state in a little bit. Um, so we have data management does, um, information management has data management and then the information that they let out into the world. We have this many, many geographically referenced records. Our database is a geo-referenced database where uh, we have it on maps and we use GIS all the time as well. And all the way through, I'm going to be putting up pictures of a variety of species, although I think that particular picture is used multiple times, to reinforce your sense that when we meet, when we say animal, it's not just a vertebrate. It's not just a fuzzy vertebrate. It includes some pretty slimy, disgusting stuff. The New England medicinal leech. Uh, that's a botanist talking. Uh, the salamanders are okay. The rattlesnakes, some people wonder about, but there aren't very many. Um, so we'll have a variety of things up as just as a reminders of, there's a lot of various things listed. We list, as we had in the last slide, of over 400 species, over a little over half of that's plants, but an awful lot of them are animals. And we don't list very many mammals because our ancestors didn't leave a few of them around. They either got rid of them or they were abundant. So wolves are gone. We do list, very recently we've taken to listing all the bats because of the bat disease that's out. But um, mostly we don't do very many mammals. There's a couple of shrews. How do we use our data? Well, we produce conservation planning tools. Biomap 2, which is 2 because 10 years ago we did Biomap 1. Posters, all these lands that are green in this are um, areas that we know there's rare species. And with planning tools, we use more than just rare species and natural communities. We've also done, include a little bit of modeling of large interior forest, undisturbed forest, um, and the clusters of vernal pools and I can't remember everything that got included this time. They modeled some super, uh, particularly good, under, less disturbed wetlands. We are talking Massachusetts. There is not much here that's pristine. I keep fighting with our environmental reviewers. Don't use that word. Land use here has affected everything. So there's nothing undisturbed and don't sort of let other people make fun of you by using words that don't make sense. We have good areas, we have some excellent areas but there's not much un undisturbed. Um, we also use our data to um, produce regulatory maps. I'll talk about them in a mi minute. And then helping management uh, of key sites where there's rare species or could be more of the rare species. We do focus on rare species. And sometimes we 
and manage habitat for them that is focused particularly on one or two rare species or a few to perhaps the exclusion of something else. And then also for land acquisition, the state has bought a lot of land. In the last 10 years or so, my agency has gone from 100,000 acres to 200,000 acres that we own. That needs management. We're shifting now into managing some of these lands. And we also try to get the forest and parks people to manage their lands for our purposes, but um, that's, that's leaning on them rather than absolute uh, control, whereas we control to some extent our own lands, and I'll explain that to some extent. They're bought for hunting, so we have to keep that in mind. So what's our database information look like? We re somebody reported, one of the staff or somebody we trust, and there's protocols for accepting data. They saw a blue-spotted salamander, which is listed as species of special concern, which is the least rare of the rare categories. At that point, we get a GIS point. We used to do an X marks a spot on a topo map, but now we all use GPS. So that's there. We know it's there. We know that in 1907, this Mystic Valley amphipod was in a vernal pool or a ditch or something in this wetland over here. That was delisted because even though it's a eastern Massachusetts endemic, it doesn't occur elsewhere in the world. It's in every ditch around. <laughs> but it's nowhere else, so we still keep track of it a bit. And that's one of, there are lots of conservation issues, and I'm going to bring some of them up. And at the end, or even while I'm talking, feel free to ask if you want elaborations. But there's so many issues in conservation. We, we like the idea, let's preserve biodiversity. Well, then things come up, and you have to start making choices. And that's some of the fun of doing it. So other things here, there's certified vernal pool. So vernal pools are where salamanders breed. The American bittern is a marsh bird. Uh, it's in a group called secretive marsh birds. Just, they're not really secretive. They're just sort of shy. Um, unless you're out there and they're calling. Um, they're in cattails or other marsh, marshy grasses, uh, very wet, so you also have to be out there to be aware of them. And then to do something with these, we um, don't report to the world those spots. Animals move. And what we report out is habitat polygons. Now, these are drawn very carefully, especially before and after that lawsuit, extremely carefully with protocols. In the past, we were often accused of being arbitrary. Developers would say, over there, that guy got to go within some distance of the actual spot where the species was seen, and you're not letting us do that. Well, it was a turtle over there, and it's a salamander here. That was flat. This was a slope. There's, we do try to keep track of the local topography as well, and physiological setup, and then the species itself. So we have protocols for every species. Now, some of them are by suites of species. The vernal pool users tend to get lumped, and then some special um, parts of the drawing of the habitat pulled out. But this, I don't expect anybody to read, but I decided to leave it on the slide just to show that we are paying attention to the scientific literature, but it's got to be the local version of the scientific literature. These are salamander movement distances, and the focus on Massachusetts has to be maximum, and the information from Virginia might be interesting, but not necessarily appropriate. So we pay as close attention to we can uh, for each the source of information that we're using for making the, the rules for drawing the polygons. Now, in this case, there's an observation, the review by the bio biologist whether to accept the observation or not, then to draw the extent of possible habitat, which is for salamanders use forest for most of their life and then go to the wetlands, um, to the vernal pool areas or the wetlands that function as vernal pools for breeding and then go back to the wetlands. So roads are out, they stop it. Uh, roads kill salamanders in the springtime. So the, this was drawn, the, the vernal pools, here's the red dot where the observation and these vernal pools were within this distance. So these vernal pools were too far for that salamander to be going. We might assume there are salamanders in here, but we don't know it. We don't draw the polygon for them. We, all our data is based on real observation. That's one of the things that, that's our, that's our, the basis of what we do is we have actual observations. We use aerials, 
We use information from aerials, but it all comes back to some real on-the-ground observation. At the very beginning, as part of my intro, it was mentioned that I focus on communities. I have an extraordinary luxury. Smaller programs, nonprofits, all sorts of small groups where they have two or th maybe two biologists or one biologist on staff, that person has to know everything. I don't. I barely hear birds singing, uh, so I, I'm no good on birds. Uh, we have three or four ornithologists on staff. We've got two or three people that know turtles and salamanders. They're not the same, of course, but those people tend to overlap. Um, we have two botanists. Right now we only have one. We're hiring, rehiring one who got a PhD and went off to be an academic. Um, I don't currently have a second ecologist, but we have two restoration, two and a half restoration ecologists. Uh, so it's, it's absolutely astonishing. Uh, I step back sometime and think of, I get to focus on communities. And I do help out the botanists. Um, but when I'm with a botanist, I know I'm not a botanist. They are detail people. They can look at a sedge and know that it's not the same as that sedge. And I say, yeah, that's a sedge. So there's, and there's, within them, there's different specialties too. Um, anyway, back to this. So we, we do the best job we can of the actual habitat that's drawn. And then we take habitats. This would be maybe a plant. This one, the white I decided I would assign as a plant. The others maybe a wetland or something. You put them all together, all the habitats for overlapping species, or if there's just one by itself, and that becomes a regulatory priority habitat. That's big H, big P. It's regulatory. If somebody's doing a development or doing some project on the ground in there, they're supposed to get run the information past us our regulatory people, and there'll be a bit more on them shortly. Um, then we have these two different, because there's multiple acts involved, this is for the Endangered Species Act, this is for the Wetland Act, this refers only to wetland habitats of wildlife because the regulations for that act talk about rare wetlands of wildlife. So depending on the legal language, conservation proceeds in different directions, or in different ways, but all to the same direction of protecting the habitat of rare species. At least in our case, that's what we're trying to do. Um, so we've got this priority habitat. All rare species habitat is priority habitat, wet, upland, whatever. But this part of it, which doesn't show up very well, but that's green, is estimated habitat, and only that is reviewed under the wetlands regulations. So for those who don't expect to be doing anything in Massachusetts, this is irrelevant except as an example of regulations complicate conservation and support it while they're supporting it. We have a couple other acts that are involved in regulating uh, rare species as well. It's listed here somewhere. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I forgot about them. Um, so the Wetlands Act doesn't include plants. It's, the point of this one. MISA is Massachusetts Endangered Species Act. The WPA is Wetlands Protection Act, also Massachusetts. That actually is incorporating some federal, uh, we protect the federal plants and animals, federal, um, federally listed species, which we don't have that many of. And um, the Wetlands Protection Act also incorporates aspects of the Army Corps regulations and um, EPA. Um, so our regulatory review people, and we have a staff of, um, I asked the chief of regulatory review, and she sat there and counted bodies and came up with, it's nine to 12, depending on the part-timeness of various people. So uh, they receive information from um, planning commissions, from town conservation commissions, and from people just submitting, I think I'm in one of your polygons, do I need to file with you? It costs money to file with us but they can talk to us ahead of time about their project and whether or not they need to be reviewed and whether they can change it a little bit to avoid review. If they're inside one of those polygons, they gotta be reviewed. If they're on the edge, um, the, that's questioned because you have a map and there's the line thickness might make a difference. And people are, some people are very cautious. I'm near a polygon, do I need to file? 
Our people are so busy, we say no, absolutely not. Um, just as a point of interest, we have the take means is defined. This is where the lawyers come in and defining things very carefully. Take a, a, an animal is to harm it, the body, to kill its body, to disrupt its nesting, to disrupt its breeding. If your dog runs out on a beach and disrupts some uh, terns that are sitting there resting, that's actually a violation of the act. People with dogs say, my dog would never do anything like that. They don't. Um, if they disrupt the nesting, breeding, feeding, migratory activity, um, or if it's destruction of habitat, that requires filing and avoiding that take. There are ways around it. There are, if it's a management, and if a management plan is on file with us and we've approved it, people can go manage lands that have rare species in them and not worry about the take because they're enhancing the, the uh, ultimate goal, which is improving the habitat and therefore improving the numbers of species, of the individuals of the species. Uh, for, and for plants, the take, of course, doesn't talk about um, nesting or breeding. Um, it does talk about plants and parts thereof. So if somebody went along and just took the seeds off um, a sedge to grow them, they have to have a permit. If it's taking the fruit off, it, we don't have any rare hickory nuts, but if they did, um, that would, in theory, uh, constitute taking parts thereof. And we joke that if somebody put one of the trees that we list through a, through a chipper, all those little chips would count as parts thereof. Uh, I don't believe that's enforceable, but uh, we, we threatened that one. Not the regulatory people. They're very straightforward and don't make jokes. Um, poor people, they, it must be difficult. <laughs> But they can't collect, pick, kill, transplant, cut, or process, or attempt to engage or assist in any such conduct. We've had call from the environmental police saying, I found somebody who had a garage full of this, uh, in this one case it was a, um, an orchid. Is this protected under the Endangered Species Act? And we said no, but there's a 1929 law that protects all orchids. And he went away quite happy. I don't know what it came to. Um, so there's a lot going on in what we're trying to protect. What we're trying, ultimately, it's to conserve the species. And we treat, keep periodically reminding ourselves that's the goal of the whole business. Um, the regulatory review, just to review it, we have the Endangered Species Act, we have the Wetlands Protection Act, the Environmental Policy Act, which is only for very big projects, and the forest cutting practices and regulations. They have an exemption, but because of their exemption, they have to file, it's just different filing, and we have somebody who's supported by funds from that to expedite the forest cutting review uh, of when they're cutting within habitat. And it's often not a problem. Occasionally we'll say, do it in the winter, you've got turtles, they're underground in the winter, so it's all right. Or the ground's gotta be frozen, or don't go near the vernal pool, put a 50 foot buffer around this area or that, or there's a rare plant. Oh, by all means, open the canopy over that rare plant, it loves the sun. So there's different responses depending on the species involved. Um, I mentioned Biomap 2, it's just that um, this is one of the products that we put out for the world, for the state and in general. Other, um, in fact, uh, many other states contacted us after our first Biomap and said, how did you go about this? How did you get the money? That was the first question. And what was involved and what's been the response? Uh, the problem with Biomap 2 and the original Biomap is they protect so much of the state. Oh, yeah. There are, there's a whole box of them, so if there's not enough here. And these are specific to the Housatonic Valley. It's a much prettier report. And uh, you are more than welcome to take that one. It's not statewide, but it, um, it's the one that I was involved in. And that's the other of those um, biomap. Thanks for passing them out. Uh, so the biomap too is really great. We, go, we did ultimately a report to each town on what, um, what rare areas were in the town. We don't tell 
we don't in general tell people where rare species are. That's exempt from the open, um, open information laws to protect the rare species. Uh, but we do have polygons that we will, and the biomat polygons, some of which are enormous and some are teensy, uh, do have the names of the species in them uh, that, that it was formed for. Um, and the towns are meant to use that information for planning and incorporating in their open space plan and for any other planning they might want to do for conservation. But it's gigantic. And in some areas, they're really too much information. So for our own lands, particularly, we went through an exercise um, a few years ago when we changed bosses. And my boss, who graduated from here a few years ago, said, we've got to prioritize the rare species and the communities, figure out which ones are the most important for Massachusetts to protect, which ones are sort of generalized species that are rare all over the place, but which ones are really our responsibility. And we all said, eh, don't want to do that, don't want to do that. It was a great exercise. And I haven't told John yet that I think it's worth something, but I will eventually tell him that that was a good thing to do. Because some things, the core is here. And if we protect it, it's protected. If we don't protect it, it's not going to get protected. Other things are range edges. Yes, we should protect things that it's at the range edge. But somebody else's job is to make sure that the core is protected. We have forests. And a lot of the things, Massachusetts wants to be forested. So to, to some extent, some of our forest stuff is very important. And our coasts are very important. So we went through that exercise. And also, we've, we've known for years, Cape Cod's got a lot of rare species. The Connecticut Valley's got a rare species. And Western Mass, where there's limestone, has got a, rare, a lot of rare species. In between, there's rare species, but they're not very interesting rare species. Um, and it's more what you would call classic Massachusetts, Worcester. Uh, most of the area around Boston, but the Boston Basin, actually has got a different geology, except it's all urban now. But in the past, the geology made it interesting. Which reminds me that we have another luxury, which is hundreds of years of collections of rare species, of species, some of which are rare, because of all the academics and because of the long time um, occupation by uh, Europeans. So we know some of the things that were common in the past and have declined. We know some things that have, were uncommon, apparently uncommon in the past and have increased and stuff that's just been spotty all along. It's a big help. Some of those places we can go back to and find the same species, and some we can't. Um, so these keys, we ended up looking at that prioritization of the rare species and going through an exercise of um, find, basically finding hot, hot spots where there's lots of rare species or the best occurrences of them or very large forest areas that are diverse, which we also want to big matters in conservation. And sometimes you get big and it's kind of beat up stuff, and we were trying to find the best big, which is often state forests or conservation, other conservation land. So we are following up with those. Now I'm going to stop for a minute on the broad picture stuff I've been talking about and talk about natural communities, because I've got to get it in here somewhere. Uh, it's the important, the most interesting, the most important stuff I'm going to talk about, of course. We categorize types of natural communities into priority types, which are the uncommon ones. And we do that by numbers or, and then we have this nice vague, ecologists are often rather vague people. Uh, fewer than five occurrences in the state or a low number of acres or low number of linear feet or miles, so just, it's, it basically means there's not much in, from different perspectives. And then the less than five is like an S1, S being state, and S5 being the equivalent of American Robin, it's everywhere, don't worry about it. So the S2, the, what I call secure communities in green, these are mudflats, these are interior forests, not the, I, I should say the broad type of, broadly defined forest types not necessarily interior, um, although they're in the database because somebody thought they were good examples of those common types. Um, 
these the red ones are the uncommon ones and usually they're tiny or fairly small i've put a very large buffer around these occurrences this is salt marsh most of that area is salt marsh and barrier beach that's all uncommon and good examples of it are we have some of the good examples in the world so we prioritize that this is Miles Sanders State Forest, which has an uh, excellent example of pitch pine scrub oak, which is a community I'll show you some more pictures of. And uh, salt marsh here and barrier beach. And out here is things that like calcium, communities that like calcium in the Connecticut Valley there and the Cape. That's where we have most of these. And then the islands have a lot too. And the reason there aren't, they're not just solid red is because I haven't spent much time collecting data there, and people who are out there haven't given us data. It's just a data-driven process, and we don't have all the data we'd like. What's a community? A natural community has a recognizable group of species. It's repeatable. They recur together. So my example here, Atlantic White Cedar Swamp, will have Atlantic White Cedar with red maple, sweet pepper bush, high bush blueberry, cinnamon fern. That's repeatable throughout the landscape. None of these are rare species. As a unit, they're uncommon, partly because we're at the northern edge of its range. Also because it's wetlands, and our, the real reason is our ancestors cut them down, and they don't regenerate well. It's a really useful wood for fence posts and, and shingles, and they got used. So they recur together in multiple places. We wouldn't want something that only occurs once or seems peculiarly to that one situation, although I do have a community that only occurs once, a type. Usually in particularly environmental conditions, and these are just some examples. Now, I have four different types of Atlantic white cedar swamps. They're all on peat, which is um, organic soil, over mineral soil of different depths. It might be next to a river, in which case it's an alluvial Atlantic white cedar swamp or in a basin inland coastal or northern Atlantic white cedar swamps, or in deep peat, it might be an Atlantic white cedar bog. But they are types that are refindable, and um, you can say, yeah, that's what I'm in. And that's the whole point of doing a community classification, is providing names for communication. So it's all written up and defined, and about to be read on the process of redoing it, because that's fun and needed. Um, our classification goal was to protect biodiversity, and using this, what we call a coarse filter approach. We take, a community occupies a lot more space than the dot of a salamander or even a population of a salamander or a few or a plant. So we take the whole area it's in and we're assuming that there's stuff we don't know about in there. There's stuff we do know, that's an Atlantic white cedar swamp, we know most of the vascular plants, we know some of the soil types. We don't know anything about the mycorrhiza, the, Lichens, uh, some people know a bit about the lichens. There's bryophytes in there. There's soil fauna that we don't know much about. Um, so does this work? Well, we got an Atlantic white cedar swamp. Those trees are Atlantic white cedar. Hessel's hair streak butterfly, which is a state species of special concern, only eats, the larvae only eat Atlantic white cedar. They are in Atlantic white cedar swamps. They don't occur elsewhere. They're a little more common than we thought originally because they only fly for three weeks in May. So you have to be in the swamp, and people, by and large, don't go to swamps in May because they're wet, extra wet in May. And you have to, because they're in the canopy, you have to go and beat up, sort of thump on the trunk of the tree, and they'll fly around a little bit, or they might come down to nectar on the high bush blueberry. But they spend their time in the canopy, so you don't know they're there. But by protecting the swamps, we've got a bunch of populations of those protected. This very rare um, heartleaf toy blade, it's a little orchid. It's two inches tall. It grows in sphagnum hummocks. I asked our botanist um, years ago, are you sure it's rare? <laughs> are you really sure that you know where they are? And he got kind of huffy and said, yes. That they've got the search image, they've looked for it in the right places. Botanists have looked for 200 years for it in the right places. And we've got it in one or two spots in the state probably a southern species and it gets up here a little bit and it doesn't I've never seen it uh, so by protecting the swamp it's in and others we protect its habitat 
the classification is a statewide, our classification is a statewide focus from, whoops, from the um, forest in Berkshire County. It's an old, this is an old growth um, red spruce stand with uh, very big 400 year old red spruces and mixed other stuff and salt marshes, everything in between. We're trying to classify and define so that we can talk about them. The issues in classifying communities, um, there's issues in all sorts of classification, even animals and plants, but there's a continuum of types. Communities aren't real. There are groupings of plants that occur together because they like the same habitats. And some of them, each, each species has a gradation of where it will occur, and the grades, the different species overlap, and the lumps, the center lumps of the overlaps, we name as community types, but they grade. Some are easy. They stop at the edge of the water. They stop at the edge of the forest. They're open, grassy communities. But there are some, like things that have oaks in them, forests with oaks, there's a whole gradation. And we name some of the types, and the rest we put into a, a very vaguely defined oak community, general oak community. And there are other types too, but those are my examples here. Um, other issues is succession. If you've taken ecology, you know that any place, if it's opened up, a, community, a ground is opened, it changes the plants and animals, their change over time. What bits of that do you name as a community type? If it's going to change or if it's not going to change? Are we going to stop it artificially by managing it? Do we then name, give that a special name? These are just issues they can be dealt with, but these are the things that come into conservation in general. What if we're managing something because there's interesting species there or because it's the artifact, the grasslands around an airport, not Logan that's got its own grassland issues, but the little airports with native species. They're being maintained, but species that like grasslands go there. Birds, which cause problems with the airport. Insects and plants, or native species are there. Then we have issues that are like mosaics. They run from one type to another, sometimes nicely changing and sometimes yeah, I'm not sure if it's in the forest anymore. Uh, yeah, it's less forest, but there's more hemlock, and over here there's more maple. They just grade, and you've got to draw lines. There's a lot of arbitrariness, but it's based on what you see in the ground. So if we use the classification, it's easier to use the, get information to use it than to define it. But basically, most community types are defined by a dominant species. Now the dominant species may be very widespread. Red maple, for example, is in every type of swamp and forested wetland in the state. So I've got red maple, black ash, red maple, black gum. These are different swamps and they're different. But they have to, um, by naming the types, you can name three or four trees, three or four shrubs, three or four herbaceous things. You know what community you're in usually, almost always. And then we put, the information with polygons on um, MassGIS, and there's a data layer for people that want to know about communities uh, up there. And I have been to each one of those polygons, well, all but one that was protect too near private land, I couldn't figure out where to park, but I've been to all the others in there, checking what an aerial interpreter did, because as I said, we are, our, our shtick is we are based on data. We know what's there, we have been there. And in the, on the species regulatory stuff, somebody's seen this within 25 years. At 26 years, it becomes historic and is not regulated anymore, unless somebody goes back and finds it again. Um, so what are we doing with these communities? And what are we doing with the conservation science with the management part? This is really kind of the fun stuff. We are managing a lot of land now. Invasive species are a major issue. This particular one, um, fallopia, um, Japanese bamboo, is, which is not a bamboo at all, it's a, a broadleaf plant, uh, is taking over floodplain forests, road, roadsides we're not so worried about, it, but it's in a lot of floodplain forests and other wetlands and some uplands in the way of taking up habitat that where the native species would otherwise be in. So we remove those, but you have to pick that battle. That 
removing exotic species takes money and effort and money and some more money. And then to keep them gone, it's a big deal. So you, that battle has to be chosen. Um, we do some burning, which also gets rid of invasives, but selects for structure of habitat and species. And a lot of our grassland birds uh, respond very well to the, uh, the first to fifth year after burning or other opening of the structure. And many plants like that are in, naturally in grasslands like the controlled burns. Some controlled burns, it's again, it's a very expensive thing to do. It involves a lot of people time. But some are kind of easy. Um, we have, uh, we own an island in um, the Elizabeth Island chain. It's, um, it's a, um, a little bump out there. And you can burn that. You can light the fire and it just, you don't have to worry about where it's going because it just goes to the sea and it puts itself out. And we're managing that habitat for birds, terns, and they like it fairly open. We're also doing some planting there of native species. I'm not sure where that shot's from, but we do occasional do planting of native species, but very seldom of rare species. So we don't approve of that. We ha there are a couple slides from now, I'll show you a place that we have done some planting of rare species to get that species on protected land. In that case, we need, it. it's an annual, to spread the seeds, and we needed it somewhere that we could control as opposed to the cemeteries that it was growing in originally. So the main communities that we do um, managing are sand plain grasslands. The sand plain part is important. These are on sand. They are grasslands. Um, pitch pine scrub oak, shrublands, which are also on sand, or ridge tops. And then calcareous wetlands, which calcareous being calcium rich, these are out in the limestone area part of the state. And this just sets those again with some pictures of what I'm talking about. The communities that we care about are often things we have to manage. And the management is often succession. We want to knock the succession back. And there's the whole conservation question of, is this what you should be doing? You're managing for a chosen state, whereas it wants to be, and that's, of course, very anthropomorphic. Um, but Massachusetts goes towards forest. Things tend to be forested. If we don't want it forested, we have to fight with it. So we have to pick places. If we want them open, you have to pick somewhere that you don't have to fight as hard. So grass, sand plains are often such places because they don't support uh, as strongly support forest. Um, the other thing we have to manage is people. Every one of those community types is subject to ATVs, all-trail, all-terrain vehicles, off-road vehicles. Um, and that's one of the big things, to get them off the property and then you can manage it for what you want. And they will say, but we have a right to be here. Where else can we go? Well, not on state land, it's not allowed, but the, there are strong arguments um, on that one. So San Play Grasslands, it's a very rare community. We have very few publicly owned occurrences. Um, a large number of state listed species, including several birds, and birds are sexy, people like to manage for birds. Um, fire suppression, and this lack of management control just means there's that a couple of the places are overrun with ATVs. But there are the other users of the land besides um, our preferred use of our species habitat. So I'll do one uh, example of these and then I'll stop. Um, Falmouth is down on the Cape, um, down here. This Crane Wildlife Management Area, if you look at it, you can see that there was an airport here once. There are the lines from the airport. And that was in World War II. This is a long time ago that the, the, the land remembers what's happened to it. Um, what they're doing here is taking out the trees that have come in. So this area in yellow was the next, er, going to be opened up and then the red will be opened again. Up here is Mass Military Reservation, which uh, has a lot of open areas, so they support some of the rare pl plants and the birds particularly, and that's important because this is other habitat for these particularly rare birds. This is where we took some plant, some seeds of a federally endangered plant and um, put them down in some experimental plots, which are now being all run together because they all responded, uh, and we now have tens of thousands of that 
mo most years, not every year. Um, whereas this year, one of the cemeteries mowed very late in the season and one plant grew. Although other years we fed three or 400, which is not anywhere near the numbers that we have of, on the state protected land. So there's different reasons for doing things. We patrolled one of them. And this is one of the ways that we've been opening the land. This is the um, Agalinus um, sand plain Girardi, it's called. Just a little wimpy plant, about what, oh, six inches when it's really robust, but pretty purple flowers that fall off about 10 in the morning. We use mechanical thinning. And yes, it does affect the soil. This is an old airfield and farm. The soil's been affected. It's on sand, though. And this is just another one, different bit of equipment taking down the trees. This is one of the birds that responds, grasshopper sparrow. It's a state threatened species. This was after a prescribed fire, and this was, is the habitat when it's been opened. Grassland means just it looks grassy. There's a whole lot of stuff that isn't grass there. Um, I'm going to stop there. If you have questions, I have more slides if you don't have questions, but they're just more pretty control management. Yes. The question is that the bottle bill is supposed, the money is supposed to go to a conservation fund and whether that will trickle down to us. I don't know that particular bill. I support it because I don't want the trash on the side of the road. Um, I don't know whether the money would go to our fund. We do have specific fund. There is something called conservation fund in DCR, the forest and parks people, and it might be going there. or the, there are other funds where the money, if it's in the state, there would be conservation and then might go to the executive office who parse it out and we might or might not get the funds. Sometimes you have to apply for it. Uh, the license plate money, for example, is not state money. It goes to a organization that pretty much uh, funds educational activities and has never given us money and says they won't, even though it's a rare species license plate. I should have said that. Yeah. Oh, two questions, and one is, what do I mean by undisturbed land? And that's the big one. The other one is, who are the environmental police, and to whom do they report? They are who used to be game wardens, and they are not in the agency, the Fish and Wildlife Agency. They are in the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs and Energy, and I forget the order of the words. Um, and that's who they report to, but they do participate with Fish and Wildlife and respond to Fish and Wildlife and um, Forest and Parks uh, requests for bodies on the ground. That's their function. They also work with DEP, the people that do the chemical and air and water quality stuff. So they're very broadly based. Uh, they are a state agency. They're not classic game warden, but beyond that. Beyond that. Uh, let me, back to the disturbed, the disturbance question. Oh, that is such a big question. Uh, when I say undisturbed, I mean by post-European settlement. We should be including Native American use of the land. They didn't disturb the soil as much. They didn't have gravel pits. They didn't farm to the same extent, to the same depth, in the same places for as long. They did bring fire and expand fire in the area. We think that they were the main source of coastal fires and fires up the Connecticut Valley. So they helped maintain the openness of uh, sand plains, which probably would have filled in without their uh, long, long-term impact, 10,000 10, years residence. Uh, disturbance I use in many different ways, uh, but mostly as removing the vegetative cover and for long periods and disturbing the soil to some depth for long periods. And it turns out that when they've done studies, Harvard Forest um, out in Peter Sam, which if, you've if you want a place to take visiting relatives somewhere environmental, 
the Harvard Forest, which is you just drive out Route 2 to Peter Sam, has got a wonderful museum. And my father and father-in-law loved going there, so an engineer and a chemist, so they, lots of people can enjoy that one. But they do lots of studies. And one of their studies was, is the forest different on previously plowed land than not plowed land? And the answer is yes. But it comes with a caveat. Previously plowed is variable. It includes actual row crops where nothing was left, pastures which were sort of plowed occasionally, maybe every seven to 10 years, but sometimes the roots of the plants would be left, so it's very different what comes back. And some pastures were fertilized or limed, but not plowed, and they have a different effect. Some things were, woodlots would be cut and grazed, but not plowed, and that's a different effect. So there's a gradations again. <laughs> Um, but the real answer to the disturbance is I'm talking post European settlement. Yes? You mentioned that the edict that came down the wall spurring the response to the importance of some of the preservation initiatives. You've not heard things like a keystone species, ecosystem engineers, what kind of important side is in your decision making, or are they often theoretical? The question is whether we factor in keystone species and um, ecosystem engineering by native species in how we prioritize. Um, they're not rare species by and large, and we try to keep them in mind in something on the level that I work on of communities, um, but less than we ought to. We tend to be more really responding to the rare species, which are often kind of not obvious in the landscape. Um, and a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of the mammals, the large mammals that would have been keystone species are gone. So that's something that we need to incorporate. You had a question earlier. The question is, why do we cut forest when, uh, to some extent, forest has a higher biodiversity value than pasture? We're not making pasture, we're making open areas. And it's an ex excellent question. We do remove forest, uh, even in strongly forested areas, and usually it's for a specific guild of species. Um, our forester was very responsive to papers on um, bird diversity and wanted openings within the forest because there are different birds in the openings and the solid, the continuous forest has forest birds and the openings have a different suite of birds. And he wanted to incorporate everything. I, uh, years ago, talked to him about that and said, if you're going to do that, open up areas that have been open before and try to cluster them. We don't want them near the edge where they're going to bring in uh, invasive species or uh, the generalist predators like raccoons or skunks. We want to have the forested things. And if you're going to, there have always been little openings throughout the forest or windstorms. Or, uh, and I think he was trying to mimic those. But the, one of the problems of trying to be everything is you break up like forest, if you put openings in it to increase the diversity with the openings, you break up the value of continuous forest. So your question is absolutely right on. Uh, the question was whether we are responding to market effects because we, we do sell wood. We do retain the funds, which other agencies don't do, and we do not do it for the funds. Uh, we are doing it for the wildlife habitat. <laughs> so we probably have time for one last question, and then we'll break. Yeah. I'm curious what your relationship is with other organizations like trustees, organizations, or other ecological funds or organizations. Do you work in the field with them? We work closely with other uh, conservation organizations. Uh, I just came from a three-day workshop with a group called NatureServe, which coordinates heritage programs, but does also does classification nationwide, North America-wide. 
Um, the trustees of Reservations Ecologists, uh, one used to work with us, and uh, others give me their property reports for the community records there. Our, when they have a beach that's got piping clovers on it, we work with them. Uh, Mass Audubon, we work with them all the time. They're, with any organizations, there's always, they're pure, or we think we're more pure, but in general, we work with other conservation organizations. But we can't do everything alone. Everybody's got their own focus, and it's marvelous. Well, I think that's all of our time. Uh, let us now.